Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Uh, this is my second time around filming this introduction. Once I finished editing and putting this whole video together, I was quite shocked at the mammoth that it turned out to be. So if you're after a quick five minute video or something that just summarizes things really quickly, uh, this video isn't going to be for you. We sort of cover everything or everything that was humanly possible in the last week. I did multiple, uh, not even 16 hour days, I think they were 18 hour days. But anyway, it doesn't matter, it's a big long video. So you've been warned, I'll add a video index somewhere on the screen, I'm not sure where, we haven't done that before, but I'll do that and I'll also pin one down in the comment section below so you can jump to bits, go over things again if you really want to. And yeah, but anyway, you've been warned, let's get on with it. For those of you who missed the unboxing, we have the Threadripper 2990WX. I'm going to say that a hell of a lot in this video, so also be warned about that. And the 2950X, I'll also be saying that a lot, but not quite as much. So I've got those two on hand for testing. And these two CPUs are very different. Um, they do share the same DNA, but they are quite different. We'll go over that in a moment. They also target different segments of the market and really probably deserve their own reviews, but for the sake of time, the time we had available, I've just lumped them together into this one big fat review. But they'll no doubt get their own individual analysis over the coming weeks. So as we learn new things, we'll put that into sort of maybe a two separate mini reviews a week or two uh, in the future. The second gen Threadripper CPUs were announced earlier this year during Computex, and since then everyone's attention has been focused firmly on the 32 core 64 thread part, now known as the 2990WX, coming in at $1800 US. There will be two models in the WX series, and for those wondering, the W signifies that this is a workstation series, and the X, well, the usual extreme nonsense, I suppose. Along with the 2990WX, there will also be a 24 core 48 thread model known as the 2970WX. Though that model won't be available till October, but we do have some simulated results in this video that we can go over. Although the 2990WX has been receiving all the attention, the 2950X is the real hero of the lineup, and basically what we have here is a refined 1950X at a $100 US lower launch price. As was the case with the second gen Ryzen 5 and Ryzen 7 models, these new Threadripper parts feature reduced cache and DRAM latency with support for slightly faster memory. So they're based on the Zen Plus architecture, which uses the 12PL process from Global Foundries. The 2950X features the same layout as the 1950X, and this means it comprises of two active Zeppelin dies, each packing eight cores, two memory channels, and 32 PCIe Gen 3 lanes. When using DDR4 3200 memory, the Infinity Fabric throughput between these dies is roughly 50 gigabits per second. As was the case with the 1950X, the 2950X can be configured in one of two ways, using UMA, Uniform Memory Access, which AMD refers to as Distributed Mode in their Ryzen Master software. Under this mode, the processor acts as a single unit, and this means threads and DRAM transactions are distributed evenly across the entire chip to maximize bandwidth. But in turn, this does increase latency, which isn't ideal for things such as gaming. Therefore, it is possible to enable NUMA, or non-uniform memory access, which AMD refers to as local mode in the Ryzen Master software. They call this a local operating mode, as the processor is separated into two domains and attempts to pair active cores with local DRAM, rather than accessing memory via controller in a separate die, which comes with a rather hefty latency penalty. The 2990WX, on the other hand, is a very different beast. It consists of not two Zeppelin dies, but rather four, enabling up to 32 cores. However, on the X399 platform, AMD has imposed some limitations to avoid cannibalizing their single socket EPIC CPUs. The biggest of these limitations being that there are still just four memory controllers. Although there are two more Zeppelin dies, AMD calls these compute dies. Basically what that means is they have no local PCIe or DRAM access. For that they must travel through the Infinity Fabric to the IO dies. So they would be the Zeppelin dies with direct access to PCIe and DDR4 memory. As there are twice as many dies in this configuration, the Infinity Fabric is also halved, so the throughput between dies is just 25 gigabits per second, assuming you are using DDR4 3200 memory. Because of this design, which sees two dies without direct access to DRAM, it means that unlike the 2950X, the 2990WX uses NUMA exclusively. AMD says this quad NUMA configuration has allowed them to create the world's first 32 core consumer processor. And just as importantly, it has allowed them to do it while maintaining backwards compatibility with existing TR4 products. There is, however, 
A fairly obvious drawback that's had me a bit concerned since we first heard about this 32 core model. We always knew that the first gen Threadripper CPUs had the potential to offer up to 32 cores, so this isn't some kind of radical breakthrough for AMD with their second gen series. The original Threadripper chips did in fact have four dies, though two of them were referred to as dummy dies, as claimed by AMD, but we always knew they were just defective Zeppelin dies that were disabled, but physically there. As after all, Threadripper is just an epic CPU repurposed for the high-end desktop platform. That said, I don't mean to sound like I'm downplaying anything here. Epic CPUs on the desktop is very much epic. Anyway, for this second gen Threadripper series, AMD has enabled those extra dies to create the 24 core and 32 core models. The problem, however, is one of memory bandwidth. There simply isn't going to be enough of it. As I just discussed, we still only have quad channel memory access, so the memory bandwidth remains the same, but now we have twice as many cores to feed. This is likely going to make an already very niche product even more focused, so keep that in mind. For testing, I've got a truckload of data, and while I tried to include as many CPUs as possible, I did run out of time to go back and retest the Core i7-8700K. This is something I can do in the follow-up content that'll come over the next week or two. The good news is I have results for a number of Intel's high-end desktop processors, such as the Core i9-7980XE and the 7960X, for example. Rather than discuss the system specs and go over all that stuff individually, I'll just throw them up on the screen in some tables, and if you want to examine them a bit more closely, you can hit the pause button. Basically, all systems were configured with 32 gigabytes of DDR4 memory. Most of them are running at the 3200 spec using the XMP timings. So there's been no tuned memory timings in any of these tests. So having said all that, let's get to results. Okay, so we might as well get this one out of the way first, Cinebench R15. As many of you are probably aware now, given that AMD did leak the results, the 2990WX achieves a score of just over 5,000 points in its stock out-of-the-box configuration. That makes it a whopping 52% faster than the Core i9-7980XE. And at this point, you're probably wondering what the hell I was on about when I said there were some drawbacks to this design, but... Hold that thought, we will get to that later on. Anyway, in this rendering benchmark, the 2990WX has no trouble blowing socks completely off. The 2950X is no slouch either, though it does only improve upon the 1950X by a mere 5% margin. Next up, we have another rendering benchmark, though this one is based on real-world software. The Corona renderer has been used to test workstations with over 64 cores, so it scales very well and has no problem using all 32 cores and 64 threads of the 2990WX. Here we do again see some pretty breathtaking rendering performance from the 2990WX as it took just 41 seconds, allowing it to complete the test 40% faster than the 2950X. Not perfect scaling, but it is still an impressive result. This also meant that it was 28% faster than Intel's current flagship Core i9 part, so yeah, that's also very impressive. Also, this time the 2950X was just 4% faster than the 1950X, so Another small gain there, but a gain all the same. Moving on, I fired up the Ryzen graphic workload in Blender. Now, this is a relatively quick test for these high-end CPUs, and we see that the 2990WX took just 8.3 seconds. This meant it completed the workload 36% faster than the 2950X and 31% faster than the Core i9-7980XE. Again, an impressive completion time for the 2990WX, but it has to be said, for a doubling of cores, we are only seeing a 55% boost in overall performance when compared to the 2950X, and there is only a minor clock speed difference between the two. So 55% more performance for a 100% increase in cores isn't that impressive. That said, I am keen to see how the two compare in a workload that takes significantly longer than a few seconds for the 2990WX to complete, so let's check that out. Disappointingly though, we do see that this much more complex Gooseberry workload was less favourable to the 2990WX. To be fair, it did still uproot the 7980XE and kick its pins in, but it was only able to reduce the completion time by 28%, when compared to the 2950X. It was able to reduce the render time by 20% when compared to the more expensive 7980XE, so that's still obviously quite a great result for AMD. Still, it is a troubling sign that in 
what should be an optimal workload for the 2990WX. We're only seeing a 38% increase in performance for a 100% increase in cores. Okay, so Povre is the last rendering benchmark that we're going to look at, and this one does bode well for the 2990WX. Here we are able to reduce the rendering time by 40% when compared to the 2950X, and this meant it was 65% faster. So again, not amazing scaling, but at 65%, it is much better than what we saw in Corona and Blender. It was also 57% faster than the Core i9-7980XE, so a massive win there for AMD. I've included the heavy multitasking results from RealBench, which runs image editing, video compression, and rendering tasks simultaneously. AMD's new 32-core processor saw a peak load of 70%, but for at least half the test, the load was down around 20%, so that is worth noting. Here we see the 2990WX providing a surprisingly poor result, taking 43 seconds to complete the workload. This made the 32-core processor slower than even the 1950X. In this benchmark, it really was the 2950X that impressed, matching the Core i9-7960X and 7980XE. This meant the 2950X was able to complete the heavy multitasking test 6% faster than the 1950X, so again, a pretty great result there. PC Mark 10 has been included just to check general performance. There are no oddities to speak of here. The 2990WX is comparable to the Core i9-7960X, which is perfectly acceptable for a super core heavy CPU. The 2950X does do much better though, as it comes in just behind the 1920X. Okay, so moving on to some spreadsheets. Excel is a real world application that we have been using to benchmark CPUs for uh, years and years now. So I thought, why not try the Monte Carlo simulation with the second gen Threadripper CPUs? As expected, the 2950X is slightly faster than the 1950X, shaving 2% off the completion time. Meanwhile, the 2990WX is slower than the 2950X, uh, basically matching the previous generation 16 core parts. So a bit of a disappointing result there. AMD's Ryzen architecture has always excelled for decompression work, and we see that the 2990WX is no exception, absolutely smashing at the 7-zip 32 megabyte dictionary decompression test with a throughput of 187,000 MIPS. That said, it was just 31% faster than the 2950X despite packing 100% more cores. Still, AMD's SMT implementation works wonders in this test, and as a result, the 2990WX was 116% faster than the Core i9-7980XE. But as impressive as the decompression performance is, compression performance leaves a lot to be desired. For compression work, the Core i9-7960X was 9% faster than the 2950X, which isn't a bad result for AMD there, and it was nice to see the 2950X providing an 8% boost over the 1950X. The 2990WX though, well, that one fell into a complete heap. Despite 100% core utilization throughout the test, performance was less than that of the 1920X and just 23% higher than the 8-core 2700X. This memory sensitive test gives us our first look at how poorly things can go for the 2990WX. It's pretty ugly stuff and short of shutting cores completely off, there appears to be no fix. I'll look at this issue a bit more closely later in the video, but for now, let's continue with the application benchmarks. VeraCrypt provides a built-in benchmark that allows users to test out how various encryption algorithms perform on a given system. These tests aren't run from slower local storage, but rather system memory, and this proved to be a problem for the 2990WX. Please note this benchmark uses 100% of the 2990WX. All 64 threads are fully loaded, so the odd performance isn't a result of underutilization, though even if that was the case, it should at least match the 2950X. The problem is what we have here is another memory intensive benchmark, though I should note that it's not that memory intensive. The 50 megabyte test only loads 50 megabytes of data into the system memory, so this has little impact on the 2990WX, even though it was slower than the 2950X and even the 1950X. The one gigabyte buffer test though loads one gigabyte worth of data into the system memory, and this proves to be a massive issue for the 2990WX. Its 32 cores become choked to the point where they're significantly slower than the 16 cores of the 2950X, offering roughly half the performance. So that's pretty shocking to see. 
We see a similar story when encoding with Handbrake. Although the 2990WX is significantly underutilized in this test, maxing out at about 30%, it still doesn't make up for the poor performance. Under these conditions, you would expect it to at least match the 2950X, and it simply fails to do so. Here, the 2950X was 15% faster than the 32-core processor, though I should note that it also offered no real uh, performance gain over the older 1950X. Meanwhile, the 32-core processor was only able to match the 1920X, which is obviously a massive disappointment. Speaking of massive disappointments, this one was... Particularly disappointing for me, we found when encoding with Adobe Premiere that the 2990WX took 35% longer to complete the workload when compared to the 16-core 2950X. The good news here, though, is that the 2950X was 7% quicker than the 1950X, and that made it just 7% slower than the Core i9-7960X. So, pretty great result there for the 2950X, and... Well, I don't know how else to put it, a disastrous result for the 2990WX. Although the export test only utilized the 2950X to the tune of about 90%, which to be fair is quite high, the 2990WX was only seen to be utilized at around 60%, which, you know, isn't particularly great. For the warp stabilizer test though, we ran a dozen instances simultaneously, and that was able to actually max out all 32 cores and 64 threads of the 2990WX. Despite that, the performance was still mighty underwhelming, and here the 32-core processor was again slower than last year's 12-core model, and only managed to match the Intel 10-core Skylake X part. So, pretty shocking results there for the new 32-core processor, but the good news is the 2950X wasn't nearly as disappointing. It was able to shave 5% off the 1950X's completion time to take out top spots, so a pretty amazing result there for the 16-core processor. Okay, so why is the 2990WX so disappointing in a lot of these tests? Well, as I alluded to earlier, it is 100% down to memory bandwidth much more so than core-to-core -core latency or memory latency. Here we can see the sustained memory bandwidth for each processor. You'll notice that the 2990WX is a little down on the 2950X, and that's due to the added latency that dies without a memory controller incur. It's a 7% drop in bandwidth, but that alone doesn't explain the performance issues seen so far. Just to confirm those results, I did also test with ADA64, and here is the memory copy performance. Again, the 2990WX was down 7% on the 2950X, but that alone doesn't explain the miserable performance in the encoding, compression, and encryption benchmarks. For that, we need to look at memory bandwidth per core, not the entire processor, but rather individual cores. Arranging these results by a single thread, we see that with just one core active, the Ryzen CPUs enjoy a tremendous bandwidth. Now, please note the performance of each core within the CPU is measured individually, and the result you see here is the average bandwidth across all individual cores. So the 2700X and 2950X, both second gen parts deliver the same 29 gigabytes per second. Then the first gen Ryzen parts deliver between 24 and 25 gigabytes per second. And then we have the 2990WX at 20 gigabytes per second. This is why we saw a slight drop in total memory bandwidth in the previous test. The margin is amplified here, showing the 2990WX to be almost 30% slower as we're not limited by the DDR4 memory in this instance. The reason the single core bandwidth is down is due to the fact that 16 of the 32 cores aren't connected directly to the memory and therefore do suffer increased latency. Finally, we see that almost all the Skylake X parts are limited to just 14 gigabytes per second, though this is less of an issue as 14 gigabytes per second per core is essentially overkill, and here's why. If we rearrange this graph by the all threads active result, the arrangement changes quite a bit. Now, for these results, all CPU cores are actively accessing system memory, and we're showing the average throughput of an individual core. Essentially, with a CPU running at full steam in a memory-intensive workload, this is the typical amount of bandwidth each core has at its disposal. This here is the very problem. The 2950X enjoys a bandwidth of 4.4 gigabytes per second per core when maxed out, and this is why the 14 gigabytes per second we saw with just a single core active on the Intel CPUs isn't an issue, since the maximum sustained bandwidth of a Skylake X processor is around 64 gigabytes per second. 
So technically with just five cores active and an extremely memory intensive workload, you are gonna use up all that bandwidth. And once you start adding more cores, you start to see a drop in efficiency as they aren't fed enough data. Naturally, the more cores you have, the worse you're going to end up being in this test without increasing the overall memory bandwidth. With octa-channel memory, the 2990WX would indeed be able to match the 4.4 gigabytes per second per core of the 2950X. But with just quad-channel memory, that figure is halved. Well, a little over halved due to the increased latency, so bit of a double whammy there. In the end, just shy of two gigabytes per second of bandwidth per core just isn't enough. And we see the problem this causes when running memory sensitive applications such as Veracrypt, for example. Okay, so before we move on to overclocking, power consumption, a few other tests, let's quickly go over gaming performance. Right, so AMD has stressed heavily stressed in fact, that the 2990WX isn't a gaming CPU, though they have gone around now and put on their website that it is a gaming CPU, but we'll touch on that later in the, the video. Anyway, it's fair to say that the 2990WX really isn't a gaming CPU, but I know you guys are gonna wanna see how these CPUs perform in games, and well, the 2950X does sort of make sense for gaming. Having said that though, games are still struggling to utilize the 8-core 2700X, so they aren't going to benefit from 32 cores, and they certainly aren't going to benefit from a design that the 2990WX features. Even so, the 2990WX isn't terrible in Ashes of the Singularity, and while slower than the 2700X, the performance is perfectly fine. We also see that the 2950X takes a small step from the 1950X, tacking on a few more frames and overall delivering a great gaming experience in this title. Also remember that we are using a GTX 1080 Ti at 1080p with the high quality preset, which is two steps down from the maximum quality. Had we used the extreme or crazy presets, then at least the top half of the graph would have been heavily GPU bound. Okay, so these results look a lot more brutal for the 2990WX, though I should note that gameplay was still very smooth with no stuttering and frame rates did remain well over 60 FPS, so there is that. Still, the 32 core model was well down on the new 16 core 2950X, which averaged an impressive 153 FPS. Then moving on, we find a similar story when testing with F1 2017, the 2990WX looks Pretty much like a low-end Pentium processor, but at least it was smooth and playable. Then we have the 2950X, which did manage to match the 2700X, and this meant it wasn't a great deal slower than the most expensive Skylake X CPUs. The Threadripper CPUs do play very well in Assassin's Creed Origins, taking out the top three spots. Granted, at most they were just a few frames faster than the Skylake X parts, but still, it is a great result. As expected though, the 2990WX does tank here and it is noticeably slower than the other processors tested. Before we move on from gaming, here's a quick look at the half legacy mode for the 2990WX. This is a feature that can be accessed in the Ryzen Master software. Essentially, it's a down core function that disables half of the dies in the 2990WX, so two of the dies and therefore 16 cores. There is also a quarter mode, which basically turns it into a 2700X. These legacy modes are for software that doesn't work well with all cores active, software like games for example. As you can see in the half legacy mode, the 2990WX sees a 10% boost in performance when testing with Ashes of the Singularity. Still, Ash of the Singularity wasn't really a bad result. What was a bad result was what was seen in F1 2017, and here we see a massive 135% increase in frame rate, and this allows the 2990WX to act very much like the 2950X. So the gaming performance can be fixed by turning the 2990WX into 2950X, but that's hardly a practical solution. I should make it very clear that in order to enable the legacy mode, you need to execute a full system reset. So it's really only something you'd use out of absolute desperation and it would only be a very temporary solution as I assume anyone buying a 32 core processor wants 32 cores and not 16 or eight. If you're wondering what the half legacy mode does for applications, here's a quick look at that. Firstly, memory bandwidth is increased massively and it's actually now faster than 2950X. And this is because we have two dies using NUMA opposed to the 2950X, which has two dies using UMA though. That's just the default setting. You can change the 2950X to use NUMA and that would see the same 75.9 gigabytes per second. 
Just to confirm that increase in bandwidth, I also ran 8 to 64, and here you can see the peak throughput now exceeds 88 gigabytes per second. Uh, on that note, please note that this figure is higher than the 76 gigabytes per second reported by Sci Software, because here we're reporting the peak throughput rather than the sustained throughput. Here we see that the inherent issues with the 2990WX is solved, and that issue is of course per core bandwidth. With more memory bandwidth overall and half as many cores to feed, we see a little over twice the bandwidth now available to each core. Now although the bandwidth per core has improved, we do only have half as many cores, and this means in workloads where the 2990WX did do well previously, it's going to be a lot slower and now produce similar performance to that of the 2950X as that essentially what it is now. And we do see that in Blender. The same is also true for Povray. Basically the 2990WX is delivering 2950X light performance. Not that surprising. However, where the 2990WX was slow in the 2950X, we are now seeing comparable performance as shown here when retesting with Handbrake. Another example is Adobe Premiere Pro CC, uh, the warp stabilizer workload. And here the 2990WX in the half legacy mode doesn't quite match the 2950X, but the results are certainly much closer now. So that's how the half legacy mode works. Uh, it's not practical or particularly useful in my opinion, but the option's there if you get desperate enough. Moving on, we have some power consumption figures, and here we see the slightly higher clock 2950X consume 10% more power than that of the 1950X under full load in the Corona benchmark, and this placed it on par with the Core i9-7900X. Then we have the 32-core 2990WX pushing total system consumption up to 383 watts, which is 19% more than that of the Core i9-7980XE. Still, it is only a 36% increase over the 2950X, at least for the total system load, so that's not bad given that you do have 100% more cores, which did allow it to complete this workload 40% faster. Before moving on, a quick note on temperatures. Using the Wraith Ripper, the 2990X ran at a very cool 59 degrees, though the fan did spin up to 2300 RPM, and while not overly loud, it was clearly audible. The 2950X ran a few degrees cooler at 56 degrees, and this allowed the 120mm fan in the Wraith Ripper to spin around 200 RPM lower, which did help reduce the operating volume. Okay, so time to overclock, and please note I didn't have a huge amount of time to delve into overclocking, and it certainly isn't the focus of this content. We can certainly follow up with a more in-depth look into overclocking in future content. For this review, I tried two methods of overclocking, one using the ROG Zenith Extreme, using the ASUS Precision Boost Override, and then another one using the MSI Meg X3 creation, using the old-fashioned multiplier and fixed voltage method. Both methods resulted in fairly similar multi-core performance, though it has to be said the ASUS PBO method provides significantly better single-core performance. Here we see that the fixed frequency overclock yields slightly better results in the blender test though, I should emphasize only very slightly. The 2950X was able to complete the render 12% quicker, while the 2990WX was just 4% faster, which, which is disappointing given that we saw a 20% boost in Cinebench. Okay, so these are some pretty alarming results. Overclocked, the 2990WX saw at least an 81% increase in total system draw, and up to 97% with the fixed voltage. Here we can see why fixing 32 cores at 4 GHz using 1.4 volts is a bad idea. The idle consumption was 182 watts, more than that of a stock Ryzen 7 1800X at full steam, and about what the 1920X draws under load. Using the ASUS PBO method, the idle draw is roughly halved, down to 95 watts, but even so, the load consumption still hits an eye-watering 694 watts in this test. I say in this test because I observed total power draw hitting 780 watts in Cinebench and 884 watts for the fixed voltage overclock. This is probably why AMD suggests that if you plan on overclocking the 32-core processor, you pack at least a 1,000-watt power supply. Interestingly, despite promoting overclocking on these unlocked parts, AMD says that if you overclock or use PBO, you will void your warranty. Not sure how they'll enforce that one, but they are claiming that any form of overclocking will void your warranty on these second-gen Threadripper CPUs, so that's something to keep in mind. 
Just quickly, here are a few simulated benchmarks using the downcore function to turn the 2990WX into a 2970WX, the 24 core part, and then the 2950X into the 2920X, which is of course the 12 core part. The 2970WX should score around 4,300 points, while the 12 core model will be good for around 2,600 points. In the Corona benchmark, the 2970WX sits between the 2990WX and Core i9-7980XE, while the 2920X is a fraction faster than the 1920X, as expected. Then when testing with Blender, we see that the 2970WX took just 5% longer to complete this test, which isn't bad given it has 25% less cores. This might indicate that the 24 model won't suffer nearly as badly as the 32 core model when all cores are fully utilised and accessing system memory. But I'll have to look into that one a bit more. Then of course the 2920X will be a slight upgrade from the 1920X. As a bonus round, I've included a heap of memory scaling data for the 2990WX ranging from DDR4-1866 up to the maximum spec I could get to work, which was DDR4-3400. Here we see consistent scaling right up to 3400, and had I been able to get faster memory to work, it's likely we would have seen a steady increase right up to 4000 and beyond. This right here is why Cinebench R15 is a completely useless application for measuring any kind of memory performance. And it's also why the 2990WX smashes it out of the park in this test. It's just not at all memory sensitive. Yes, you can adjust timings and see small gains, but yeah, you're not going to see great gains. Corona is another benchmark that just really isn't that memory sensitive either, at least again within reason. It's not until we drop down a DDR4-1866, which isn't really a thing I suppose, that we see a major drop off in performance. From DDR4, 2933 and beyond, there's really no gains to be had. 7-Zip is a memory sensitive application and this is best demonstrated by the decompression test. However, it was the compression test that really hurt the 2990WX and therefore we don't really see the results that we'd probably expect to see here. Perhaps the increased latency is also an issue for this test. I'm not 100% sure on that one. We will need to do a bit more digging to find out what's going on. Well, that was plenty of data though. In some ways, I feel like we're just starting to scratch the surface on this one, especially with the 2990WX. Over the next few weeks, I do want to spend as much time as I can with this processor looking into various productivity workloads, um, see what I can throw at it and see if I can find anything that's not a rendering uh, workload that performs really well. Anyway, for now, let's have a look at a couple of uh, price versus performance scatter plots before wrapping this long review up. Let's take a look at the Povray data as the 2990WX had its best showing here. It's much faster than the 7980XE while costing slightly less, so that's obviously a good thing. And that means for rendering tasks, the 2990WX really is the bee's knees, and while it might not offer the best value overall, it certainly provides the best value at the top end of the scale. The 2950X destroys the Core i9-7900X, offering significantly more performance at a reduced price. Really, the only better option here is the heavily discounted 1950X. Still, in Povray, both the second gen Threadripper CPUs look very good. The only other price versus performance scatter plot that we're going to look at is Premiere, and this pretty much sums up the 2990WX when handling non-rendering tasks. Here we see how badly things can go for AMD's new 32-core processor. When encoding with Premiere, the 2990WX is considerably worse value than the Core i9-7980XE and therefore every other CPU tested. You're basically looking at Threadripper 1920X performance for almost four times the price. Thankfully though, the 2950X is again a very solid option and offers pretty much the best bang for your buck of any of the new CPUs tested. Well, the 2990WX, uh, certainly an unusual beast. In short, AMD's made a 32-core CPU that appears very good for rendering, and that was about it in our standard test suite. The memory limitations do seem to make the 2990WX a, a very focused product, and I'm not sure how many users are going to find it useful for powering their workstations, uh, given the inconsistent results. That said, I am in the process of conducting some extensive multitasking benchmarks. And while I am still seeing some mixed results, I think overall what I am seeing 
is painting a more positive picture. I would also just like to note that AMD themselves have uh, admitted that this is a Focus product and that's why they changed the name to include the W uh, before the X. So it's not just the 2990X. Uh, they also show in their review guide that the 2990WX beats the 7980XE in applications such as, or benchmarks such as Corona, a Blender, Cinebench, Povre, Maya, and Adobe Dimension. And of course, what do all those programs have in common? They're rendering applications, of course. Meanwhile, the 2950X was tested against the Core i9-7900X in programs such as Handbrake, TrueCrypt, 7-Zip, Premiere, and then of course, a few other rendering applications. So while the 2950X can clearly do it all, as we've shown in this video, AMD is well aware that the 2990WX can't. I think that's probably the best way to put it. The only issue I have is that they're not exactly telling you that, at least not by the information that I've found on their website. And rather than give you a chance to work out that the 32 core model might not be all it's cracked up to be for your particular workload, they took pre-orders for only that part a week in advance. I did voice these concerns with my AMD contacts over the weekend and they assured me that uh, anyone who's unhappy with how the 2990WX performs for their particular workload can cancel their pre-order. Uh, no money should have exchanged hands at this point, but if it has, they can get a refund and get something else, maybe the 2950X. So we're not ready to close the book on the 2990WX just yet, but given that there are some obvious shortcomings, we feel the $1,800 US asking prices it's just a bit much. The Core i9-7980XE is already grossly overpriced as it is, but at least it does do everything really well and doesn't really have any uh, weaknesses other than the price itself, which is obviously quite a big weakness in terms of price versus performance, which is why we much prefer the 2950X, but it doesn't suffer any performance issues where it's much slower than the lower core parts in its product family. Of course, the 2990WX has all the usual problems, a super core heavy, uh, desktop processor would have, and that is utilization, finding software that can fully utilize it. But of course, the kicker here is the software can't be really heavy on memory access, or it will cripple the 2990WX to the point where it's as slow as a mainstream desktop CPU. This ultimately is the issue with the 2990WX. We're perfectly fine with most software, uh, such as Premiere, for example, not taking advantage of 64 threads. But in that case, the 2990WX should act like a 2950X. And as we've seen, that's not always the case and sometimes it is much slower. So how do you know if a particular workload will cripple the 2990WX or run like a dream? Unless you have someone test it out for you, test drive the CPU, you really don't know. And it's not enough for them just to test the software you'll be using. It's that sensitive that you really need the kinds of workloads uh, tested that you're using. I think AMD should have just done a better job of stating what the 2990WX is designed for, uh, rendering workloads, show where it is really good, and I'm talking about their website here, not what they've told reviewers or anything like that. Forget the media, I'm talking about telling the consumers for the pre-orders that it does have some shortcomings, in heavily uh, bandwidth dependent workloads, the performance may be lower than expected. So yeah, I think stuff like that would have just helped clear this up. Uh, based on our testing, we found it to pretty much be the Threadripper Pixar edition, or maybe instead of W, they could have called it the 2990CB edition. That would have made more sense. Anyway, like I said, uh, we're just not ready to call it yet. The 2990WX still has more to prove, but at this point, I think it is quite clear that I personally won't be upgrading my workstation to the 32 core processor, which is a bit of a disappointment. Still, I will be getting an upgrade and that upgrade will be the real hero of the second gen Threadripper series. It's no secret that I really liked the 1950X and the 2950X is simply a more refined version, typically offering five to 8% more performance while coming in $100 US less at launch. So great buy that. Uh, right now though, the 1950X that is coming in at $780 US, so that one is a cracking good buy right now. But still, considering the 2950X's introductory price, it's, it's really amazing value. 
I have nothing bad to say about the 2950X. It does everything really well, and in my opinion, it takes over from the 1950X as the ultimate high-end desktop CPU. I had really hoped that my editing rig would be receiving the 32 core part, but as I said before, those plans have now been scrapped and I will be moving to the 2950X instead. Of course, if you have a 1950X already like I did, then the 2950X doesn't really offer a noteworthy or worthwhile upgrade. As I said, it's only about five to 8%. Uh, so it's not really worth scrapping the 1950X yet. So yeah, your CPU hasn't been rendered obsolete just yet. And that is going to do it for this one. I hope you guys did enjoy this video. I know it was a very long-winded look at the second generation Threadripper CPUs, but yeah, I think it was worth it. And if, if you think so as well, please feel free to hit the like button, put a tremendous amount of time into this one. Uh, subscribe if you want to see more content like this. And if you appreciate the work we do at Hour Unboxed, then consider supporting us on Patreon. Thanks for watching. I am your host, Steve, and I will see you again next time.